Hello there, my fellow lords and bureaucrats, and welcome to another lore video about the empire of Warhammer Fantasy. Since I am mostly through with introducing the main races of this universe, I have decided to take a break from talking about their various histories. Instead, today we are gonna take a deeper look at the Empire. And by deeper look, I mean talking about its political organization, laws and government. I know those aspects do sound kinda boring, yet they are actually a lot more interesting than you'd think. I am your host, the Grimdark Narrator, and without further ado, let us learn more about the empire that Sigmar started, shall we? Contrary to popular belief, the empire is not a unified nation ruled by a powerful central government, but in actuality a massive confederation of fiercely independent states and provinces, whose inhabitants are tied together only by common language, faith in Sigmar, and somewhat of a mutual imperial culture. Nowadays, there are two types of state, the province and the city-state. Sigmar was a wise and calculating leader, and he had the foresight to realize that the empire was far too big to be ruled by one man, and so he gave the title of counts to all the tribal leaders, each one responsible for managing his own territory but subject to the emperor in matters relating to its rulership. Their independence was supposed to counterbalance the power of the emperor, should he prove to be too tyrannical a leader, as well as to ensure mutual but non-violent competition among each of the imperial counts. When it became known that Sigmar did not have an heir to inherit the imperial throne, the invention of the electoral system was successful in avoiding a civil war among the various counts. However, it did complicate matters even further in creating and maintaining a successive ruler. Those ambitious elector counts that wish to become emperor have been known to give away privileges, titles and power to any man who will cast his vote for him. The interests of all the voters were such that they seldom rallied around a strong candidate, for they may find another of his rivals far more generous in their gifts, which has resulted in the weakening of the imperial system. Even when the imperial throne is transferred to his heir by majority vote thanks to the previous emperor's influence, voters were quick to remind the newly elected emperor to renew the promises made by his predecessor. While the empire had a fair share of strong and highly competent emperors ruling the empire, many times has the imperial throne been occupied by an uncaring lord who allows his subjects to steal and exploit the imperial system. Some went so far as to ignore the imperial edicts once placed by wise and caring rulers of ages past. However, the imperial system still continues to work as a whole, for the empire as it was its purpose, allowing any wise and ambitious emperor to take the throne and use its powers to better the people under his reign. In theory, the emperor is free to make whatever laws and regulations he or she wishes, and have it apply to the whole of the empire. The truth, however, is more nuanced for laws must pass the review of the prime estates, who in turn report to the electors. A bad report is often all the excuse an elector needs to quietly not enforce the law or deny it altogether in times of a weak emperor. In such cases, the emperor, if he is determined to see the law obeyed, will exercise diplomatic and even public pressure on the recalcitrant elector to come to heel. Often, this is enough to gain grudging acceptance. But if the elector is determined, an emperor may claim preemptory jurisdiction and have the case heard in his own courts. In rare cases, continued defiance by an elector may merit military action, as Karl Franz's ancestor Wilhelm threatened against elector Gunwald of Averland in the case of the Pudding Tax Revolt of 2433. Imperial law concerns itself mostly with revenue, security from foreign and internal threats, 
the regulation of sorcery and the rooting out of chaos cults. Many emperors have claimed jurisdiction over the succession to electoral thrones when the succession is in dispute, and even the right in extreme cases to depose electors, elevate new families to the electoral rank, and even give whole provinces to another elector, as was the case with the Drakwald under Emperor Mondred. Though rooted in ancient law and the precedent set by Sigmar himself, no elector formally acknowledges this right, and all resist it in any but the direst cases, lest a lasting precedent be set. Imperial courts exist in all the major cities of the empire, including the capitals of the grand provinces, with judges appointed by the emperor through the office of the imperial authority over the case leading to extended wrangling while the defendant or parties to a civil case swing in the wind. Due to its size, the imperial government is considered far too large and complex for a single man or woman to administer properly. It is common that every day the emperor must devote attention to dozens of questions, from newly introduced tax policies, the final appeal of a prisoner convicted of treason, or even the official opening of a ceremonial fairground. To succeed in establishing a priority order in this complex system, and ensure that only individuals whose cases are really crucial get an audience with the emperor himself, successive emperors have often surrounded themselves with advisors. These are chosen from members among the most prominent noble families, so they may assist on legal, financial, diplomatic, and military matters in the emperor's stead. Over time, this gathering of counselors turned into a formal meeting, which officially became the Council of State. Every member of the council controls a large bureaucracy, which helps administer the affairs of the state. Such is the importance of their position within the government, that the common people will probably never see these members in person, except maybe indirectly in official or ceremonial events. While each of these can bear many titles, these official positions go by the following. Spiritual leader, Chancellor of the Reichland, Counselor of Matters Magical, the Chamberlain of the Seal, the Military Advisor to the Emperor, the Chancellor of the Imperial Treasury, the Supreme Law Lord, and the Chamberlain of the Imperial House. I would also like to give more detail on the so-called Prime Estates. The Prime Estates is an imperial organization which was created to help administrate the actions and well-being of the Emperor in person. At the end of the 11th century, when Boris the Incompetent tried to confer the title of Duke to his favorite racehorse, the electors unanimously decided that they had to administrate the Emperor's actions as to keep face with the Empire's people. So they selected one representative each to form a watchdog body that would take the name of Prime Estates. This institution is located within a beautiful building in the confines of the capital, ostensibly open to any person of recognized nobility, although the lackeys of the emperor are carefully kept away. In fact, the Prime Estates has now become the Supreme Court. All imperial edicts are carefully examined in the interest of the state, with documented reports being immediately sent to the electors who can choose to either support or veto the edict. This organization has the powerful ability to simply refuse any edict that does not suit them or the empire's interest, allowing the prime estates to have an almost complete control over what the emperor is logically placed to decide. Every elector count has an established representation in the capital, embassies directed to a loyal family member or close acquaintance. These ambassadors would discuss new imperial decrees or legislations, as well as send these reports back to the electors that had elevated them to such a position. As they have the power to reject decisions that do not suit them, it is important for the emperor to obtain the approval of the prime estate if he hopes to accomplish anything. In theory, the emperor also has a veto over the choice, 
but in practice, it would be very difficult for him to exercise it. Indeed, without a real majority support among the electors, the emperor has no chance to assert his right of veto. The latest attempt to do so was Emperor Matthias II, who wanted to institute the first ever democracy. But the threat of civil war by the other elector counts was so pressing that he was forced to give it up. The Provincial Government Since the time of Sigmar Heldenhammer, the lands of what is now the Empire were divided between many semi-autonomous states that are nowadays collectively referred to as the Great Provinces or the Electoral Provinces. The provinces are further divided into various counties, baronies or leagues, whose administrative governors are appointed by the elector count. These regional governors, in turn, appoint the governors of the cities. The practice, however, is not universally prevalent. Some cities have known to elect their own municipal council. Theoretically, the boundaries of the imperial provinces were based on the territories of the ancient barbarian tribes that Sigmar united around him during his reign as the nation's first emperor. However, over the last few centuries, the dynastic quarrels and ruthless ambition between various lords and counts have altered the borders, where new states have emerged and others disappeared entirely. The citizenry that lives within these provinces are very proud of their people's traditions and ancestry. In essence, the people of each province are in many ways a completely different people, with many expressions or dialects varying from province to province. The people to the east and north are generally more hardy and warlike, as they are regularly victims of invasions, while those in the west and the south are perceived as more cosmopolitan and civilized. The style of government also varies from province to province. Talabekland, for example, is firmly autocratic, while Saland had many democratic ideals and institutions during its existence. In the overall health of the nation, however, the political structure between various governments has very little influence on the lives of the average citizen for the rich are still widely favored over the poor who live in squalor. The lands of the great provinces are themselves a patchwork of smaller, semi-autonomous states or holdings belonging to a certain religious cult or martial order, chartered towns and cities, and lands held by the various noble families or even elector counts of other provinces. This patchwork is the result of a millennia of feudalism, inheritance, war, and purchase. Each noble, from the smallest landholder to the greatest duke, is theoretically beholden to one above them, up to the elector counts, who themselves only answer to the emperor himself. Thus, if the emperor has a problem with the Duke of Nibelwald, for example, he has to make his complaints through the elector of Averland, who the duke is a vassal of. And finally, a few words about the city-state. The city-state forms a privileged semi-autonomous state that can assert its political, legal, and military defense on a specific territory, usually the closed city wall and its immediate area. The city is a concentration of economic, political, religious, academic, and ideological power thanks to its very diverse society and its semi-democratic ruling. Many cities form independent political entities within the greater imperial government. For the vast majority of the citizens of the empire, it is through the city that the government is manifested in everyday life. This is where the taxes are collected, where the criminal courts are served, where military service is completed, and where the goods are sold. The governmental structure can vary from city to city. In some of them, the governor is appointed by the elector count as an autocratic authority, while others consist of democratically elected individuals from several noble or mercantile families. And that, my friends, has been what I wanted to tell you about the government of the empire for today. 
since I am, at this point, pretty much willing to cover any aspect of the races I've already talked about, you can feel free to make suggestions in the comments below. Would you like to learn about the Empire, its military or religion? Would you like to learn about the government of the Dwarves or the Elves, their military, their religion? You get the idea. Was this video informative or enjoyable? If it was, please click the like button and subscribe for more content. Thank you kindly for watching and have an awesome day. Sigmar's blessings be upon you.